invite your attention this evening to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3. The book of 2 Peter in chapter 3. We'll look at one verse of Scripture tonight. And uh, last Sunday night, we, we looked at this passage of Scripture. And I told you maybe for the next couple of weeks, we will be looking uh, at the all-important uh, teaching doctrine subject of repentance in the Bible. Uh, from Old Testament to New, repentance uh, is preached, it's taught, and it's extremely important. Uh, if you remember last week, we kind of looked at the definition of repentance, mainly just what it is. And tonight we'll go just a little further with that uh, in our lesson tonight. But notice what Peter says here in verse 9, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Now remember, th this chapter here, he's talking about the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord's coming. Uh, he says, you know, everything you see is going to melt with a fervent heat and, and all of that. And, and uh, y'all, I'm telling you, that, that, that's real. There's a lot of people are ignorant of the fact that the Lord's coming. There's been people that have scoffed. And he talks about scoffers in this chapter. Uh, you know, listen, there's always been scoffers when it comes to God's Word, God's promise. But I want you to look here at verse 9. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. That means the Lord is not slow concerning what he promised uh you say well, what does that mean well you gotta understand when it gets time for the lord to come can i tell you things are going to happen just like that the lord's not going to be slow concerning his promise unto us as some men count slackness he says but is long suffering to usward aren't you glad for that tonight god's patient with us he's not only patient with his people he's patient with the world uh, you know, and you say, well, man, I just wish the Lord would come. I wish I understand that. And I know John in Revelation prayed, even so come, Lord Jesus. We're waiting on the Lord to come back. But do you realize, y'all, until then, we got a job to do. Right? God's patient. He hasn't brought judgment yet. Why? Why is that? Well, look at the rest of the verse. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see that word? Uh, that's God's will. God's will is that nobody dies lost. God's will is that nobody goes to a devil's hell. That is God's perfect will. Okay? He's not willing that anyone should perish, but he is willing that everyone come to repentance. So remember the Sunday school teacher who asked her, her class that morning, you know, uh, about you know, what is repentance? And, and the young boy said, you know, it means to be sorry for your sin. And the, the young girl corrected the young boy and said, well, not only does it mean that, that you're sorry for your sin, it means that you're sorry enough to quit. Y'all, that's what repentance is in the Bible. That's what the Bible means by the word repentance, right? Why is this word used over a hundred times in the Scriptures? That's significant. Well, if you remember, we started with, with, with what repentance is not. Just to give you a quick recap of what we, talk, what we talked about and bring us up to where we are tonight. We, we talked about what repentance is not. And, and repentance is not just sorrow. Okay? Some people think, well, just because I had a moment where I felt sorry or, you know, a little guilty about something, that's it. You know, I had an emotional moment, so therefore I must have repented and I'm all right with God. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. You can be sorry and not repent. You say, can you give me an example of that? Yeah, I'll give you a good biblical example. His name is Judas Iscariot. You remember him in the Bible? Hey, the Lord chose him as one of his disciples. Answer that one. Hmm? Chose him knowing that Jesus said, one of you is a devil, and a devil from the beginning. And if you remember when Judas went out and he betrayed the Lord, uh, the Bible says that, that, that he came and, and then he just basically apologized for what he did. He threw the money, uh, you know, that money down, that silver down on the ground. He went out and he hung himself. I want to tell you, Judas experienced sorrow, but he never repented of his sin. There, there's a key here. A lot of people tonight are, are going to miss heaven simply because they're, they're banking on some type of emotional experience or something in life you know, to get them there. I want to tell you, repentance is necessary. Repentance is necessary to get you there. Godly sorrow is important. Don't get me wrong. Godly sorrow is important. Uh, but the Bible says that for godly sorrow worketh repentance. In other words, it leads to repentance, okay? 
So uh, repentance is not sorrow. Repentance is not penance. Remember that? Uh, the word penance basically means rendering some type of payment for your sin. That, you know, I, I can offer enough money or, or I can beat myself, you know, enough and, and do whatever and I'll be acceptable unto God. Friend, can I just remind everybody, not, nothing you'll ever do will make you acceptable before God. Nothing, right? Our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags before a holy God. And, and so nothing that we can do will make you accept. That there's nothing that we can do to pay for our sins. Y'all, if, it, if that's the truth, God never would have sent His Son to die on the cross if we could make some type of penance in order to make it right with God. Also, repentance is not reformation. It's, uh, it's not just giving up a bad habit. It's not just what some people say, turning over a new leaf. Right? Have you ever heard somebody say that? Well, I'm just going to turn over a new leaf. Well, you may do that, but the problem with turning over a new leaf, you're going to be turning the leaves over until Jesus comes. Okay? And what that does, that's, that's vain. That's self-glory. Uh, you know, if I, if I quit a bad habit or if I turn over a, 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 a new leaf, then, then that's something I've done. You know, I'm proud of myself there. That's not repentance. It's reformation, but it's not repentance. So you say, well, Brother Brian, what is repentance? I'm glad you asked. Repentance simply means a change. It's a change. Uh, and this change is evidence in three elements. Remember? Number one, there's the intellectual element. In other words, a change of mind. And, and then there is the emotional. Listen, there is emotion attached to repentance. There really is. It's not all emotional, but there's an emotional aspect of repentance, right? There's the emotional element, a change of heart. And then there's the volitional element, which is a change of will. So repentance means a change, right? Put all that together, and you've got a perfect picture of what true biblical repentance is all about. Repentance, Bible repentance, is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. All that together is what true repentance is. Now let me give you a perfect illustration of that in your Bible, and that's the prodigal son. Right? The, the Bible says, if you remember the story uh, the, there in, in, in Luke 15, where, where it talks about the prodigal son, and, and you know the story, how he, he left, the, you know, he got his inheritance and he left and he went out and wasted it with, with riotous living and all of that. But, but, but remember when he wound up in the hog pens of life? Right? The Bible says, number one, he came to himself. Y'all, there was a change of mind. Okay? Here he is out in the hog pen. He's eating what the hogs are eating, and it dawned on him. It just hit him. You know, in my father's house, where I left, by the way, <laughs> where I thought it was so bad, in my father's house, the servants of my father basically have bread enough to spare. And here I am eating what the hogs are eating. You, you see, what the prodigal son came to, he came to realize that... that he came to a change of mind. The Bible says he came to himself. And not only did he come to himself, there was also a change of heart because he goes further with the analogy. He says, I have sinned. He re and he calls it what God calls it, y'all. He, he, he's not sugarcoating it. He's saying, you know what? I did wrong. I sinned. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my father and tell him, Father, I have sinned before heaven and I have sinned against you. This young man had realized he had sinned and he admitted it. So there was a change of mind, there was a change of heart, and all that led to a change of direction. You see, after his mind was changed, he got his mind right, after he got his heart right, well, I'm going to tell you, your steps are going to follow. Right? He stepped out of that hog pen and he went back to the Father's house. That's the change of will, right? And, and so all of that together is true repentance. That's what the Bible means when the Bible says we must repent. Now, that's what the definition of repentance is. It, it, it is a change of mind, a change of heart that leads to a change of direction and action in our part. All that together. Now, is repentance preached? throughout the Bible. Yes, it is. I'm not going to give you every verse of Scripture that, that deals with the, the actual repentance, but I want you to understand repentance was taught in the Old Testament. 
Now, you may not see the word repentance, you know, or a prophet saying, you need to repent, you know. Uh, there, there were. Uh, that there was other words used. But I want you to listen to this verse. And you're familiar with this verse, but, but listen to it in light of repentance. Okay? Proverbs 28 and verse 13. It says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. You hear that? In other words, if a person tries to cover their sin, guess what? God says what? That ain't going to prosper you. Hey, David tried to cover his sin, didn't he? But you know what? He didn't prosper from it. No, I, I mean, it was mass confusion after that. But the verse goes on. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but, watch this, Whoso confesses and forsaketh shall have mercy. Now I want you to think about that in light of repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart, leads to a change of action. He says, if, as long as you're trying to cover your sin, uh, you have an alibi for your sin, you try to excuse your sin, he says, as long as you're trying to do that in this world, you're not going to prosper. But, but, Whosoever confesses and forsakes it shall have mercy. Y'all, that's repentance. That, that is repentance taught in the Old Testament. The word confesses means to acknowledge it. It means to speak out. Uh, do you remember what uh, the, the Bible, 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, now what does it mean to confess? Y'all, the word confess literally means to agree with. It means to say the same thing as. You say, well, what does that mean? Okay, let me put it to you like this. God says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right? All of us are sin. Are sin. You're born a sinner. Can't help it. That's just what you are. We received that nature from Adam. Everybody that's born is born a sinner, right? But guess what happens when I confess my sins and repent of my sins before what I get saved, right? And, and so in other words, when I confess my sins, basically what I'm doing, I'm agreeing with God. I'm saying, you're right. Y'all, that's what happened the day you got saved. You might not realize all that took place in your heart and your mind, but it did. If, you, if you've got salvation, that's exactly what took place. God convinced you through His Holy Spirit that you were a sinner and that you're wrong and God's right. That somehow, some way, He convinced you in your heart and your mind of that, and you said, you're right. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Ah, whosoever confesses and forsakes, He says, shall have mercy. Forsakes means to what? To abandon it. To leave behind. That's repentance. Repentance was preached in the Old Testament before the birth of Christ. Repentance was teached in the Bible during the, the, the time of Christ, the ministry of Christ. Remember John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. His message when John the Baptist, and boy, what a character he was, right? Can you imagine this? Can you imagine a bunch of Jews looking out there, and this guy walks in, this mountain man of a guy walks in from the wilderness wearing camel's hair and, and a locust hanging from his lips? How many of y'all would invite him into your pulpit to preach, huh? Delight first. You're thinking, well, we probably had worse than that. I'm, I'm just saying, hey, I'm, well, what, what I'm saying is, you know, appearance-wise, that's not too, you know, what, what I mean. But here he comes. He's been trained by God, y'all, in the wilderness. He had a message. And as soon as he hit the town running, what did he say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That, that was his message, repent. And in the same chapter, y'all, same chapter, Matthew chapter 3, after the baptism of Jesus, when Jesus began his public ministry, the first thing he preached was what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist's message was repent. Jesus' message was repent. Wow. John the Baptist preached it. Jesus preached it. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 13, 3. Can you imagine? Listen to this. He says, but except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Whoa. What is that? Well, it's, can I tell you it's exactly what it is. It's a message from the Lord that says, unless you repent, you'll perish. 
So basically, Jesus' message was what? An ultimatum. So was John the Baptist. An ultimatum. Repent or perish. Wow. Some people say, well, that's just old-fashioned preaching. Well, you know what? Jesus apparently was an old-fashioned preacher. Right? He just called it what it was and got up there and just let the preach the word and let the chips fall where they may. Y'all, I'm telling you, there were some that believed and there was many that rejected. But still, he never compromised the message. Repent, and except you repent, you shall perish. Salvation by grace is for the repentant soul. That's who it's for. And judgment without mercy for those who resist. That's how strong that message is. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter preached, the apostle preached repentance in our text. 2 Peter 3, 9. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? God's will is that everyone come to repentance. Paul preached repentance. Uh, you can go back to Acts chapter 17 where Paul was uh, in Athens. And remember, he went up to Mars Hill where all the intellectuals were. They, they, just, they just wanted to listen to some new doctrine, you know, all these philosophers there. And they called him up there. They said, what's this babbler? What's he going to say? And so they got him up there to preach. And I'm telling you what, Paul, like, you know Paul. When you gave him a minute to preach, he's going to preach. He laid it all out before him. He went all the way back to the beginning and he just laid it out Jewish history everything talked about God remember that unknown God that they had that they had made a marker for he said that's the one I'm going to declare unto you and he preached unto him the Lord here's what Paul said when he wrapped that message up he said you know this ignorance that you, and I'm paraphrasing this ignorance that you have for all this time God has winked at that in other words he's overlooked it he says but now he said Acts 17.30. He says, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repent. Y'all, that word is used over and over and over. Well, you say, what's the importance of repentance, Brother Brown? What are you trying to get to? Here's what I want you to understand. This is an all-inclusive word for every individual and groups of people in the world. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, first of all, the lost are to repent, right? That's what the Bible says. Remember, listen to this verse, Matthew 9, 13. Jesus said, For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Right? I'm not come to call the righteous. He says, I'm come to call sinners to repentance. Now, there were some of them during that time who felt they weren't a sinner. That, 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 they're, that they're related to Abraham, therefore they were in good shape, you know, and they did, and they could believe whatever they want to believe, but Jesus said, I'm going to tell you something right now, uh, you know, they that are sick need a physician, right? And, and so he says, I'm not, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So who, who is to repent? Number one, lost people are to repent. Number two, backsliders are to repent. That's saved people who's in a backslidden condition. Do you know what the answer is? Well, I'll just do better. I'll just try harder. No, the, the answer is repent. That's, that's what it is in the Scriptures. Uh, Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Now, we're going through 1 Corinthians, and you know how blistering of a letter that is. He's really getting, getting after them. But you know when you come to 2 Corinthians, he, he, Paul just kind of pours his heart out there, and, and apparently they had made some changes and they had done some things that he had told them to do. And here's what he said in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. He says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. Now listen to this. Not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. You see that? You see, that's why repentance is not just sorrow. He says you sorrowed to repentance. Sorrow led you to repentance. Wow. So apparently they had repented on much of what he had talked about. He rejoiced because the guilty repented. Y'all, repentance is necessary for the lost. It's necessary for backsliders. Can I tell you that even local churches in the Bible are called to repent? Not only does God call individuals, he calls groups collectively, New Testament churches to repent. Wow, there's times when the church just needs to get right. Amen? Amen. Um... Uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, y'all, we don't have time to, to read all this tonight. If you remember, 
the book of Revelation, the Lord sent this book literally to seven churches of Asia, across Asia Minor. There were seven local New Testament churches, and that's who the book of Revelation was. Now, you've got to understand, in biblical times, when a letter was sent to a church, basically what it was to do, it was to be a circulatory letter. And what I mean by that is, when this church got through reading it, they'd send it to another church. And they'd read it, and they'd send it to it. That's how the word got around, y'all. I mean, they just kept passing the, the, the letters from Paul or the words from the Lord or, or whatever uh, to these churches. But if you remember, out of seven churches, he called upon five of them to repent. Wow. Two out of five. Okay. <laughs> you know, but five of them to repent. Remember the church at Ephesus? He, he called upon them to repent because why? They had left their first love. He says, I have what somewhat against thee. He says, because thou hast left thy first love. And do you know the exact next thing he told him to do? Repent. Repent. And, and so here was a church that was guilty of not loving Jesus the way they were supposed to. They left, that they, they, they had basically put aside Jesus. Let me ask you something. Is that possible to do in church work? Is it possible to get so busy with all that, here's Jesus out here on the outside trying to get in. You know what I mean? If we're not careful, we'll make church about us, we'll, you know, about our priorities and, and our likes and our wants and our wishes and our programs and our... And what we do, we just keep pushing the Lord a little further out the door. Matter of fact, he, he told him that later. He said, here I am on the outside knocking, trying to get in. But I, 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 and I'm sure the Lord's trying to get into a lot of his churches today. That's sad to say. But they left their first love. Let me tell you something. Your first love is Jesus. When you get saved, you hear me? The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Your first love is Jesus. And what he did and what he went through in order to secure your salvation and pay your sin debt in order for you to go to heaven, how in the world can we push him aside? But he told this church, he says, listen, you're, you need to repent. Remember the church at Pergamos? Uh, he got onto them basically they were to repent because they permitted the doctrine of Balaam to be taught that's what he tells them now, go back and read that in Revelation chapter 2 they allowed the doctrine of Balaam now you go back, got to go back to the Old Testament and understand that story you know here was Balaam uh, the so called prophet of God and, and basically uh, you know he tried to curse God's people but God never would let him curse them right but what he did he eventually got them to compromise so the doctrine of Balaam in the Bible, when you study, when that word's mentioned, the doctrine of Balaam basically is a doctrine of compromise. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something. One of the things that we've got to be leery of here at Delight First is compromising with the world today. We've got to be true to God's word, and, and that's why the Bible says, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's what the Bible says. And so we've got to constantly be on guard of compromising. God, help us if we ever compromise what he's printed this book. Amen? He told the church at Thyatira they would repent because they allowed Jezebel to teach and beguile God's servants to commit sexual immorality. Now, what's the doctrine of Jezebel? Go back to, remember, Ahab and Jezebel. Basically, that's a doctrine of immorality, immoral, compromising with idol worship and all, all, immoral, all that. That, that, was a, that was being taught in churches. Y'all, you'd be surprised today what's being taught in churches. It'd blow your mind, some of the things that are being taught in churches. Uh, we're so concerned about not offending, and I, I understand that. Never do we want to be offensive here with what we do. And what, but y'all, I'm going to tell you what. The Bible's pretty point blank about a lot of stuff. You know, and you got to, let me tell you something. If you want God's blessings on your life, you stand where he stands. You call it what he calls it. And I'm telling you right now, you'll never have to worry about the power of God in your ministry. You'll never have to worry about the blessings of God in your life if you'll stand where he stands. These were churches way back then that was beginning to compromise with, with the world and the standards of the world. Sardis, if you remember, was to repent because basically she was a dying generation. 
or dying congregation, church, dying. That's what Jesus told them. He says, you have a name that you live, that you live with. He says, but you're dead. That's what the Lord told them. Here's a church who thought they had it going on. They were alive. Jesus says, you're dead. Wow, that's a, that's a contrast, isn't it? Hmm. They were to repent because they were a dying congregation. That's something else that can happen to churches today, too. They just die out, y'all. Do you realize in our work we've probably lost more churches in the last two years than we've gained in the last 20? I'm, and I'm, I'm, tell, I'm talking about lost. This, close the door, sell the building, gone. You know what I mean? Congregation, dying congregation. Laodicea was to repent because she thought she was rich. She thought she didn't need anything. Jesus said, oh, but can't you see? You're, you're, you're wretched, you're poor, you're blind, you're miserable. Wow, does he know your heart or not? You know what I mean? He knows every church. He says, this is, you think you're rich, and just because you got a lot of money in the bank, that, that that's what he says, but yet spiritually, you're wretched. Hmm. i tell you what, I, I'd rather have no money in the bank and God's blessings on my ministry than to have a million dollars in the bank and be far removed from him. You hear me? Now, I'm telling you, it's not about churches are called upon to repent. So, so let's wrap this up real quick. What, what, what am I trying to say? Because where I'm trying to get to is next week's lesson. And that's the fruit of repentance. What, is, what does repentance look like? Okay, when the Bible tells us to have a change of mind and a change of heart and a change of action, what does that, now we looked at the prodigal son, that, that's one evidence there, but, but what is the fruit of repentance? And that's going to be next week's lesson, but here's what I want to say tonight. The lost are to repent or perish. That's what Jesus said. The backslider is to repent or be disciplined by the Lord. The local church is to repent or, notice what he told all five of these churches. If you don't repent, he says, I'll come in unto you and I'll remove your candlestick. Now, y'all, what does that mean? Well, it means what it says. What's a candlestick? It's their light. It's their testimony, right? Uh, y'all, God's, God's purpose for churches today is to be a bright light in a dark world. That's why we're here. We're here to be a beacon. We're here to shine for Jesus, not for ourselves, for Jesus. It's not our light that the world needs. It's his light through us. That's what the world needs, right? And so he said, I'll tell you what, though, if you don't repent, I'll come remove that light. Oh, you can carry on as business as normal, but who wants to do that in church work, right? I don't want business as usual. I, I, I don't want to be your, you know what I mean? I want the light of God in my life. I, 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 I want his authority and his light in my ministry if we don't repent he says you'll lose your effectiveness in a world lost in sin and the saved must practice repentance if they're to enjoy the unbroken fellowship with God and listen every day of your life every day of your life you are to practice repentance to enjoy the unbroken fellowship with God he calls upon individuals he calls upon uh, on groups, on churches. Uh, Y'all, everyone falls into the category of repentance. Everyone at some time, point in your life is to repent, right? Uh, that's not a bad word, by the way. It's a good word because it gets you right with God. Maybe you're here tonight, you've never been saved. You say, Brother Brian, what do I do? Can I tell you what you do? Repent. Repent of your sin. What does that mean? It means I have a change of mind, change of heart, change of action. Repentance is an about face, if, you're, if you want to use a military term. It's turning from my sin and turning to God and embracing Him. It changes my direction. You see, that's what repentance is. Trust Him. He's the only one that can save you. Maybe you're here tonight and say, well, I'm just backslidden. You know, I, I just realize I'm not where I need to be. I used to be on fire for God. You know, I used to. You hear that? I, I used to sing the choir. I used to teach class. What about now? I, I used to be dependable. What about tonight? What, what's happening? Repent. And even collectively as a church, we've got to be careful. 
God help us when we think we've got this on our own. And all we need is a little money in the bank and we can be. Friend, Jesus said, without me, you are nothing. And we're nothing without him. We need the Lord. And if we're not right with him tonight, we need to repent. Let's stand together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you tonight for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us hard lessons, truthful lessons that we find throughout your word. And Father, I pray tonight that you'll help us. Help us, Lord, to, to understand repentance and, and to be repentant in, in our life and, and just to have that unbroken fellowship with you. Father, our desire tonight is to see other people come to Jesus. We desire to, that revival would break out among your churches. Lord, help us tonight that repentance plays a big, big part of that. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you said you'd hear from heaven and you'd heal our land. Oh, God, help us tonight if we do what you called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing.